to the third webinar in the 2021 National Archaeology Week series, which aims to shine a light on all the different types of archaeology that we have here in Australia. A big thank you to the Australian Archaeological Association and the National Archaeology Week team for hosting this event. My name is Dr Georgia Roberts and I'm coming to you today from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Run Country near Melbourne. My co-host is Edward Cooper, who is one of the Australian Archaeological Association's student officers and joins us today from Water uh, Matagal Country near Sydney. Uh, so this is a recorded presentation, uh, just letting you all know. And uh, we would ask that if you would like to ask a question, you can do so at any point during uh, the webinar, but please do use the Q&A function at the bottom rather than the chat. Uh, so, uh, Edward and I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Silvano Jung. Silvano is the Principal Consulting Archaeologist with Ellen Gowan Enterprises, based in Darwin in the Northern Territory, and comes to us today from the country of the Larrakia Nation. His expertise spans some 30 years, specialising in the field of maritime archaeology and Indigenous cultural heritage. Silvano holds a PhD from Charles Darwin University and has published widely on the aviation archaeology of World War II flying boats lost in Broome and Darwin and is currently researching the history and archaeology of the submerged material culture in the Northern Territory. So welcome Silvano and we look forward to hearing your webinar. Righty, I've just unmuted. Uh, go to screen share. Yeah. Okay, continue, continue, share. Here we go. Well, um, welcome everyone. Thanks for turning up for the, um, this afternoon's talk. Um, this talk was sort of inspired by a, a fieldwork program that's we're hoping to undertake this year with the uh, Western Australian Maritime Museum. And it's uh, basically been 20 years this year since we've done any formal investigations of the uh, Broome World War II flying boat wreck sites. So we're, we're hoping to go back there uh, this September and to do some more side scan sonar work and uh, uh, wreck site inspections. So I'll, I'll just for, uh, for today's talk, I'll give you a background on what what we did in Broome and um, what what the sort of current understanding is now of the wreck sites and uh, how we can uh, what 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 the next steps are for for, for the um, the the research program. So, uh, for those for those of you who've never been to Broome, this is a map of its um, lo location in uh, in Western Australia. Uh, it's uh, just on the uh, the edge of the western uh, Kimberley, and uh, the actual wreck sites are uh, um, off um, Town Beach in Broome, which is uh, um, sort of uh, Broome's local local beach, not to be confused with Cable Beach. Anyway, oops, wrong way. Uh, on the third of March, nineteen forty-two. Um, the the uh, um, Japanese third Kokutai uh, launched a surprise air raid on Broome uh, and and Wyndham on the same day, yeah, and um, um, nine uh, zero fighters and uh, one Babs reconnaissance, reconnaissance uh, aircraft uh, flew to Broome and uh, entered around uh, uh, entrance point. Uh, which is uh, today Broome's local local jetty. So uh, the uh, people of Broome were taken by complete surprise. These these uh, zero fighters, which is uh, which I've got up uh, the picture that I've got up now, were were the uh, the state of the art fighter at, at that time in in 1942, and uh, they they uh, they they were also surprised to have found. Um, 15 flying boats at, at anchor uh, just off uh, Broome's town, uh, town beach. Uh, the, the, um, there, there were a number of uh, evacuation flights 
uh, being carried out of, from, from Java in modern day Indonesia today. And um, um, the, it was basically the, the, the evacuation of the um, uh, Naval Air Service uh, from, from uh, Java. And uh, they, uh, they were staging their way through Broome um, and uh, got, got caught on the water by a complete um, surprised air attack. So this is one of, one of the most remarkable photos that uh, came out of uh, the air raid. It was actually taken by the uh, um, BAPS um, aircraft, which uh, shows the flying boats on fire. So uh, there were another six aircraft that were lost on uh, Broome's aerodrome uh, as well. And they're they're land-based aircraft. Um, with the, that, that also includes uh, a, 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 a Liberator, which took off uh, just before the air, air, air raid started. So th this is this is one of the, the one of the photos that uh, we've been using uh, to try and locate all, all the the the, uh, the broom flying boat wrecks. Um, uh, to date, we've we've only found ten of the fifteen. So we're we're, we're we're still looking for another at least another three. We 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 suspect that uh, two of the wrecks have been salvaged. Uh, this is a general map to show uh, the uh, the uh, location of the wrecks that, that we have found to date. Uh, there are um, seven in uh, that are exposed at low tide. Broome's got some massive um, 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 spring low tides that, uh, that you know that exposes these wrecks, and um, and uh, you can actually walk out to them. Uh, at, um, at uh, you know during these times, and so uh, so you've you've got about a two three hour window to get out to these wrecks. And what you can see is uh, two Dornier flying boats and three Catalina uh, um, uh, aircraft as well. Oh, that's, sorry, there's actually four four Catalinas. Uh, one of the Dornier sites is only a debris field, unfortunately, and we suspect it was one of the ones that was salvaged. So this is the uh, current un um, um, understanding of, of, of the wrecks in terms of their um, identification. We've also found uh, uh, you know, one of the, the short Empire flying boats, which was a, a, a large 18-ton, uh, five-engine um, uh, flying boat. And... Uh, those uh, that's that's in deep water. We we suspect it's uh, it's of uh, um, the the Royal Australian Air Forces uh, um, A eighteen ten, uh, which uh, which was uh, yeah, basically uh, yeah, but, you know, taken over from uh, um, um, the uh, um, from uh, Boac uh, at the start of the war and uh, was uh, used to to, to uh, ferry. Uh, to um, ferry um, military people around. So this is this is the uh, the current understanding of, of the uh, sites at the moment. Uh, we've got a, a, a actual aircraft identification for a number of them, but uh, some we, we we can only identify them to to the uh, type of Catalina they were, for instance. So this is uh, one of the photos that emerged well, about 12 years ago now. It's, uh, but, you know, we, before that we only had the uh, Japanese aerial photograph of uh, the air raid, but uh, now we've got a series of photographs that were taken by someone on the shore. Uh, for those people that know Broome, it's uh, near uh, Kennedy Hill, uh, Kennedy's Hill. And um, so someone just popped out after the air raid with their box browning camera and snapped away some photos. And uh, we've got this remarkable photo here showing uh, the, uh, the flying boats on fire. Uh, it, as you can see, it's, uh, it's uh, probably some time after the air raid is there's quite a lot of smoke that's developed. So um, a lot of the flying boats may, may, may have sunk by this stage. So you must remember though that uh, the, um, a number of the, the flying boats were uh, fully fueled and just about ready to go, or were in the process of leaving when they were sunk. So um, they they they, um, they caught fire as a result of being attacked. So on on these flying boats, there were something like uh, 
about 170 odd people, and uh, most of them were, were were women and children, which were being evacuated by the uh, um, the um, uh, the aircrew. They, they, were, they were essentially their, their their families in a way. You know, if they were if they were going to leave Java, they weren't going to leave their families behind. So they they uh, took them on board. And uh, uh, tragically, uh, about 80 people were, were killed, and uh, uh, most of them were, were uh, um, the women and children as well. Uh, this is this is a uh, sort of a modern reconstruction of what what the what Roebuck Bay would have looked like on the 3rd of March 1942. So it would have been a, a scene of complete devastation. Right, just to explain the types of aircraft that were lost in Broome, there were five uh, uh, Dornier flying boats that were, that were made in Germany for uh, the Netherlands East Indies prior to the, the war. And uh, this is, uh, this is one of the planes that was actually sunk in Broome, the X-1. It was actually the um, prototype of, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, of the K-1 flying boat so this is it's a, this is quite a rare machine in itself so um the the factories in uh, the netherlands that uh, also were building these were were, uh, were overrun by the germans and uh, the the germans continued to build these as well for the for the for the luftwaffe so we've got these uh, german made aircraft uh, both in 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 uh, in Allied and Axis hands. And this is a, a, a three-engine flying boat with um, uh, sponsons on the, the side of it, which, uh, which it uses for flotation. Another type, uh, the, um, the most common type that was uh, lost in Broome uh, and, and the most numerous were, was the twin-engine Catalina flying boat. So this is one of the, uh, um, one of the um, Dutch flying boats uh, the Y seventy four um, photographed in in, in um, later on in America, and uh, in this photograph you can actually see a lot of the air crew that uh, had um, survived Broom, so their their, their names have been um, um, are highlighted in bold. So just this just goes to show what uh, what the uh, Catalina looked like. It was uh, it was the most numerous flying boat ever ever made so that's that's why there's still there are quite a few of them around today flying around in the um, you know, operation ones today so there's something like about 50 of them that are still flying something like 3200 were actually made oops and um they were um this is this is quite interesting I, one of the things i've been trying to do is to trying to re reconstruct the, the color schemes for the aircraft. And this is one of the RAAF, uh, the, one of the, the Royal Air Force Catalinas that had uh, escaped from Singapore that was in Broome at the time. So it just goes to show the, their, uh, their color scheme as well. This is quite a rare color photograph of an early type of, of uh, Catalina. So this is the, uh, the PBY-5. Um, the, the US Navy, also lost uh, two Catalinas in in Broome, and but uh, they were the earlier um, um, PBY four types, which could be distinguished by by having different engines than the ones in this photo. Uh, the other type that I mentioned, uh, the third type, was the the uh, uh, four engine short em Empire flying boat. Uh, so. Um, Shown here is a, a photo of um, Corina. Uh, this this was being operated by uh, by Boeing at, at the time of the air raid, and um, it was still being used in in uh, civilian um, uh, service at that time. But uh, uh, she was being um, serviced at the time by uh, uh, the uh, um, Nickel Bay. Which was one of the fueling luggers in in Broome at the time, so she was uh, completely um, um, fueled up and uh, nearly ready to leave. So yeah, you can imagine that one of the one of the big uh, 
smoke clouds in the previous photo that I showed is probably of, of her burning with the amount of fuel on board with one of these things. Right, this was the, the other short empire flying boat, um, Centaurus. Uh, when it was taken over by the, the RAAF, it was given the, the de uh, designation as A18-10. The only difference really was that uh, uh, there was a, 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 a machine gun fitted on, on top of the fuselage with a, with a scarf ring. So you physically had to get out and, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the airstream and, and fire the gun. Uh, you, uh, it, it also had other guns inside the fuselage which um, poked out through the windows, but it was rather crude. So they were mainly used for uh, uh, ferrying people around and, uh, and, um, and evacuation, uh, um, evacuating people. Um, the original work in Broome didn't actually start 20 years ago. That was, uh, that was only the, the uh, second expedition that the Western Australian Maritime Museum did with uh, uh, Mac McCarthy and Jeremy Green. But uh, the initial work started in, uh, in, in around about 1974 when uh, um, side scan sonar survey was uh, conducted uh, using the old uh, um, paper feed, feed uh, um, you know, sort of machine that you know, sort of wasn't electronic. And unfortunately, uh, uh, nothing really uh, emerged from that because uh, because of equipment breakdown. So it was still it was still on the sort of cutting edge in a way. But so uh, so it, it wasn't until two thousand and one that we could go back with some more modern technology and actually find some more wrecks. So this is uh, this is the survey which we did. Um, 20 years ago uh, uh, with on, on the, the uh, museum's boat. So it was, uh, it was funded then by uh, Prospero Productions that, uh, uh, that, uh, that were uh, making a, a, a documentary on the Broome Air Raid called the Bay of Fire. And, uh, and uh, so they, they, they not only funded the, uh, the documentary, but also the excavation of a couple of couple of the flying boat wrecks there, which, uh, which ended up in the positive identification of one of the sites. So which was one of the um, Dutch Catalinas, the, the Y-59. So, so we, you, you know, we got some absolutely wonderful results of that and some, some uh, uh, clues as to where the, the, uh, the uh, sunken um, uh, flying boats are. But we, we didn't quite get all of them though. It was a, it, it was a, it was a bit more complicated than uh, just getting a picture of, of, of the ocean floor. It's a, it's quite a jumble down there, and it's still try, um, difficult to try and work out what's what. So that that's that's why I I thought I'd uh, start a PhD program. Uh, that's me, a long time ago. Uh, the, after getting a scholarship through uh, through AMA, the Australasian Institute for Mar Maritime Archaeology, but, and, and that was to uh, catalogue and study the the, uh, uh, the artifact collections that we uh, excavated from Broome uh, in 2001. And here I am uh, um, uh, cleaning up a, one, a, a dining fork that was recovered uh, from uh, from the Y59, and it had the the aircraft serial number on it. So that's how we could, we could find it, we, you know, we could identify the site. And the thing is, we found two of these forks and luckily we, uh, both of them had the same serial number. So we could pretty much say that we've, we've identified that flying boat. So moving on to my, my PhD, I uh, started the, uh, the, the, uh, the field season in 2003 and it spent five months in Broome. I love this photo because it just shows how beautiful the water is in, in Roebuck Bay, nice and calm and almost milky, uh, oily, and um, it's just perfect diving conditions. Had lots of help from people like John Lashmar, Jeff, Jeff Parker, local broom divers, and other volunteers, such as Karen Sinager here. We were diving together under 
uh, 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 mapping the uh, the wreck that uh, um, uh, that uh, the Western Australian Museum found a couple of years earlier. So, as part of my research, then we I I, I, uh, I wanted to uh, map the sites and uh, to um, to also catalogue the uh, the um, the oral histories and uh, stories of the crew and passengers who were on these planes, and uh, so this this is only one aspect of it was to actually um, to go out and physically put a tape measure over these sites. And, and one of the techniques I used as well was to uh, uh, implement uh, a bit of aerial archaeology, and uh, chartered a helicopter to get some aerial um, uh, aerial perspectives of these sites to to assist with mapping. So this is one of the, the uh, dorneas that you can see exposed at low tide. And it, it's, uh, it, 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 uh, it was determined to be uh, the Adornia X1, which I showed you a photo of previously. So she's pretty well smashed up, caught fire. And uh, so there's been a lot of damage to the hull and whatnot, but you can still see a section of the tail, the motors. Uh, you know, a lot of the engines of these sites were uh, salvaged and, uh, uh, you know, are found um, around Broome today. This is a, um, a, a terrestrial shot of uh, the Dornier X1, what, what you can see when you walk out there. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not very far from Town Beach, which you can see in the background. So uh, this is what um, the uh, mapping turned out. Uh, and, uh, so this was uh, done by uh, uh, sort of uh, right angle projections of the baseline. So you can, you can see what, what's still there and what's missing, so to speak. Not all of the exposed wrecks are easily accessible. For instance, uh, one of the sites, which turned out to be a uh, Catalina, uh, it, you can only see the uh, the uh, gun turrets and the uh, the tops of its propellers exposed. But this was one of the sites we excavated in 2001 as well, but um, we didn't get any diagnostics on artifacts of this one. So it was a, it was a, a sort of a real fluke to get uh, uh, the artifacts of uh, the Y59, for instance, and. Uh, uh, incidentally, it was um, it, it was um, full of um, refugees, uh, and um, so uh, there were a, a large number of artifacts on on, on board. And uh, you know, one of the most enigmatic thing that you see when you go diving on these sites is uh, people's uh, shoes still flapping around, half buried in the sediment. So, you know, I guess if you've got to go for a swim, you've got to take your shoes off. And there's shoes everywhere. There's munitions, there's all accoutrements of the crew and, 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 I, and of the passengers as well. It was a remarkable sight. But we still don't know what this one is. We, we suspect it could be the Y67, another Dutch Catalina, but uh, that's, that's, that's to be argued later. Uh, this was the underwater, underwater survey of... Um, of the site that I just showed you. So she's pretty well fragmented as well. You, you'll notice that the, the wings uh, the wings are uh, separated from the fuselage. I'll talk about a little bit about that later. And this is the, the, the Y59, which we identified in 2001, which had all the uh, shoes and the artifacts on it. So, the excavation we did was just around, just behind the, the, the pilot seats, and we found a, a, a pretty high density uh, of artifacts behind there still. This is the Y59 from the ground. Some of the underwater finds shoes, a razor, and ammunition, belts of ammunition still. There's a lot more there as well.
the uh, site plan of Y59. So uh, both wings are uh, still on site, which is uh, quite quite remarkable, and but uh, uh, broken uh, once again. So uh, this, this was a this, this this was a bit of a puzzle, you know, why why all these wings were were broken, which uh, I uh, I uh, sort of attributed later to site formation processes. Uh, this is one of the most intact uh, Dornias. It's of the Dornia X3, and uh, and you can still see the uh, pointed bow on it. And this this was being flown by. Uh, uh, Rudolf Zerda at the time. This is the the Adornia from from the ground. It's a it's a rather iconic site in Broome now. It's it's where the sort of hovercraft tours take people, so it's uh, it's heavily visited. And this is its uh, its rec uh, rec site plan. It was excavated by Stan Gader, Gader in the 1970s, and he found diagnostic artifacts there that uh, that we we used to identify the aircraft as well. So th there's uh, there's propellers and wing debris from the site as well. Some it's, it's over over 100 meters off it. So we we suspect it's been damaged by cyclones or boat anchors have dragged things over we're not sure there, there is another propeller and wing debris that may be associated with this site and this was what we believe is an um an raf catalina from singapore it's uh this is the first one that you encounter as you walk from town beach so it's uh it's it's one of the of the British Catalinas, so she's still there. But uh, it's it's got the engines on both wings, on um, both sides again. So there's 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 been sort of flipping action happening here, and I I, I argue later that this is a, as a result of its its deposition, its deposition at uh, time of loss. So this is what uh, the um, if the end the the RAF Catalina looked like uh, shortly after the air raid, they, they were visited by uh, um, military personnel uh, in in forty two, um, and uh, luckily we've they've, they've managed to snap some some wonderful photos for us. And, and this is the wreck side of uh, FVN. It's. Uh, it's tails missing. You know, a lot. You know, you know, a lot of these cats have lost their tails, which is a bit sad. But uh, I'll show you one. It's a it's a classic one, but uh, we can't find the rest of it. So this is this is something else that sort of presents itself. Um, there's been sedimentation at uh, at uh, a number of these wrecks, and this is one of the one of the, uh, one of the ones that uh, is uh, virtually entirely buried it's a, it's of a catalina believe it or not but uh the upper part of the fuselage is virtually all gone so you've only got the the lower lower sections of the fuselage left and half of that's buried as well but the thing about this one you know where the wing is here there's an engine and a propeller and we're hoping this year to expose the uh, propeller hub which uh, which is a diagnostic feature of these Catalinas, so that'll that'll tell us what type of Catalina it is, and and uh, by by um, uh, by virtue of that, we can tell what what nationality it is. I suspect that this one is Dutch as well. Now, this is what it looks like from the ground. Uh, you can still see something, but uh, you know it's uh, you know it's not until you actually get out there and map these sites that you can try and figure out what's there. And this is its site plan, site 13. So th this is all the all the wrecks that are exposed at low tide that you can actually walk out to. And now I'm just going to move, move on and talk a little bit about the four 
uh, deep water sites. So two of them uh, we've determined to be Catalinas, uh, PBY fives. So uh, most like uh, they work that they are Dutch as well. And uh, an Empire flying boat, and the other site is uh, just of an empennage with tail section. So, but we're still looking for the rest of the wreck. So this is what the under underwater sites look like. Um, another Catalina. Um, this one's got the uh, port wing on the starboard side and the starboard wing on the port side. So it's been flipped over, tail's missing. But you can see the bow of it pretty well. This is another one which, which has wings on both sides. Uh, PBY5 identified on the basis of engine um, diagnostics once again. Now there's a number of artifacts here. We haven't excavated these sites, so this is something that can be done in the future perhaps. And this is the tail site. So this, this is really rare to actually find an empennage like this anywhere. There's, there's one in Broome as well, which I haven't seen. I mean, in Darwin, which I haven't seen yet. But, uh, and it's a, it's a long way from any of the known wrecks in Darwin. So this 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 tail may may, may have broken off before the, the aircraft sank, and hence it could be some distance away from the main wreck. But it's a tantalising grip as a uh, you know, glimpse into what other wrecks are out there. So with all these inverted wings and whatnot, I came up with a, 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 a theory of, uh, of, of a wing inversion to, to explain the current condition of the wrecks that we see today. And just shown here is uh, the, 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 well, like in, with the Catalina type, the, the fuel tanks were between the two engines. So when that caught fire, the, the, uh, the wing integrity failed and the, the wings could could do wing clap in a way so they could hit themselves uh, as they're, they're flipping over and fall on one side or they can um, pass each other and so, so, they, so you get an inversion of the wings. So this, this indicated to me that the, the uh, wreck sites are, uh, are in situ and that, and that they haven't been moved there uh, with uh, subsequent salvage work. So this is just an overall view of the, uh, the um, nine sites that we have here, uh, minus the tail site. But uh, I, I, I did, uh, I was calling that a site at some stage, but now I'm, I'm not sure because it may be some distance away from the rest of the wreck. So this is what they all look like, basically. So there's, there's still a lot left there on the ocean floor. Uh, in terms of the salvage, uh, we, we, we had a bit of a win when we, uh, we heard about uh, HMIS uh, King Bay uh, and its exploits with uh, Claude Scholes in uh, 1942. King Bay came in to uh, basically clear the uh, approaches to the Broom Jetty so that the flying boats wouldn't be an obstacle to, to navigation. So we suspect that uh, King Bay uh, salvaged the Dutch Dornier X-20 and um, another one on the approach to it, which was uh, an, uh, one of the outlier smoke columns that I showed you before. So we've two, two of the sites have been virtually uh, um, completely destroyed, but uh, uh, King Bay said that uh, they actually picked up sections of the aircraft and um, um, deposited it somewhere else. So there's basically a secondary uh, deposition site somewhere. And so we, we hope to be looking for that this year as well, maybe. So uh, there is an area just uh, south of Gantheon Point where the lighthouse is in Broome, that's 90 metres deep. So King Bay may have um, dropped bits of uh, aircraft over the, in, in deep water over there, but we're not sure. And that was Claude Scholes a few years ago. He made it to a very ripe old age. He was over 100. 
so one of the other aspects which which is which is sort of continuing in a way and that, that's that's uh, I've got more data since then since uh, uh, 20 years ago was information on the crew and passengers uh, uh, there was no uh, passenger or crew lists kept at the time of the air raid as it was a mad frantic escape out of Java so we, we don't know exactly who was who was there or exactly how many people were there or, or how many people were actually killed but uh, so this is uh, this is some of my research into the into the uh, uh, families and air crew that were in Broome. But uh, one of the aspects I found recently was um, on, um, on one of the uh, crews of the Dutch Dorniers uh, of uh, the X-28. Uh, this was of um, Gerhard Drost, who was a, he was a mechanic. And, uh, um, for some reason, his account wasn't uh, recorded until recently uh, in, a, in a book about Broome. So I managed to, to contact his family and uh, get, get a bit more of an insight as to, uh, as to how he was missed. And, and, and uh, I got an account of the loss of his aircraft as well, which was just fantastic. And so it was another one that was, uh, it was moving. Uh, taxing to leave, as it turned out. So it's uh, it, it could be it could be an outlier from one of the main group, group of wrecks. But uh, anyway, this is uh, this is just to show you that uh, uh, data is still coming to hand as to uh, who, who was in Broome at the air time, uh, uh, in Broom at the time of the air raid and uh, and uh, what what their accounts of, which uh, which uh, helps to fill in a bit about the, the story as to what happened in Broome. Uh, this is this is when I met the uh, a lot of the, the families in uh, in uh, the ne uh, Netherlands in 2008. I, I got a grant from uh, the Dutch Embassy in Canberra uh, to go and uh, give a paper on my research in Broome at um, Lelystad at uh, the the Aviodrome Aviation Museum, and uh, we we had a chance to to meet all the Dutch survivors uh, that were living in uh, the ne Netherlands, and at the front is uh, Rudolf Itzerda, who was the he was the pilot for the X twenty three. And this is a later photo of Rudy uh, after he became a flag officer, and uh, unfortunately, I just heard that uh, he had died last year or the year before which marks uh, he's, he's the last of um, the air crew. The air crew are all gone now. So it's, it's just the, uh, the passengers that are left, the, uh, the uh, children, passengers, which are, are now grown up, of course. So this is what we hope to do in the future, is to investigate these uh, white circles. This is where I suspect the other flying, missing flying boats are. Uh, you can see near Site 22, the Empire flying boat there. Site 21 is probably Corina, because in Broome there were only two uh, mooring blocks set up for the evacuation flights in February 42, and both the Empires would have been on these blocks, so we suspect that they'll, they'll be together. So we'll be looking for Corina, and hopefully for the rest of the aircraft from the tail section site. And which I suspect might 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 even be a, a U.S. Navy aircraft, um, because uh, they were in Broome for a couple of weeks prior to the air raid, and uh, were, all, were always moored in deep water. So you you get all all the shallow water sites are probably of the Dutch uh, aircraft that were arriving on the morning of the third of March and the night of the second, and they 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 didn't know how far the water was going to go out. <laughs> so. So they, they uh, tried to moor as close to the jetty as they could. The other thing about Broome was that, uh, it, you know, it's not just about um, bits of um, aluminium on the ocean floor, it's, it's the people's story. So here we have the um, commemoration of the air raid here in 2017 when, when um, 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 uh, Van Persie uh, came uh, to um, 
and, and his daughter Emmy uh, came to um, commemorate the, the loss of their, their grandfather's uh, aircraft, the X X one, uh, which which uh, which which resulted in the, in the loss of family members. So this was a you know rather moving ceremony. A lot of these crosses here symbolise all the people that were killed in the air raid. This is at Bedford Park in uh, 2017 in Broome. So there's there's one sort of epilogue to this story, which I just wanted to briefly mention because we can't mention Broome without mentioning the loss of uh, a Liberator aircraft from the United States uh, United States Army Air Force, and it was operating a um, uh, uh, aero medical flight out of Broome, and it was uh, shot down by Lieutenant Kudo, who's in the top right hand picture here. And uh, uh, that side is still missing. Uh, there were about 20 people on board, mainly uh, um, um, uh, stretcher cases and uh, wounded personnel being evacuated out of Java, and there was only one survivor. Um, um, Melvin uh, um, Donohoe, who uh, made it to the beach. There was another guy who made it to the beach, but he, he, he doesn't appear to have survived. He sort of disappeared as well. But uh, the only other casualty of uh, the broom air raid was Kudo himself, who was uh, shot down, we believe, by uh, Gus Winkle at uh, the aerodrome. And his uh, zero has never been found either. So. We've got the flying boats are missing and, uh, and two other types of aircraft as well. But uh, our focus will be on uh, the, the flying boat research, uh, I hope, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll uh, come a, a step closer, a closer to solving this mystery of, uh, uh, you know, what happened to the uh, Bruin flying boats and where, and where are they today? So thank you very much for your time. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. <laughs> Thanks very much, Silvano. That was really interesting. Um, and I, I was finding all this terribly interesting because my grandfather actually um, flew with the Catalina Squadron out of Darwin during the Second World War. So this has all been very interesting for me to hear all about your research. Um, we do have a question. From, yeah, one of our audience members has asked a question, Jeff. Um, about uh, you sort of the, the end goal for your research is it to um, do, do further surveys to um, ultimately excavate some of these uh, sites um, or just to sort of identify where these uh, the the boats have ended up the, the ships well um, site site location is still uh, a major focus in the research that we're doing and uh, we're not going to be excavating this year and all that's that's such a massive undertaking that uh, we ended up with some like 35 artifacts or something like that from the last which which are still being conserved at the at the museum so it's a major undertaking to excavate these sites uh, but uh, no we're, we're we're just hoping to locate more of them and perhaps identify uh, uh, the the individual aircraft by by actual uh, sort of structural elements on the, the airframe themselves, like with the engines, for instance, we can tell what type of plane it is, but what type of engine it is. So, but uh, to to identify individual aircraft, we, we, we will that that'll be another step in the future, where you have to excavate and find uh, personal accoutrements of the crew, or whatnot, like a like a dining fork with the aircraft serial number, or in the case of the Doiner X1, there was a toolbox found with, uh, with all the tools were marked with the aircraft serial number. So that's so that, that's that's what that's later on, I think. But uh, at this stage it's still looking for for you know, you know for where the wrecks are. Fantastic. Um, well would anyone like to ask any questions if you want to put them in the QA um, while people are thinking uh, I was wondering, Silvano, as this is a public talk for National Archaeology Week, whether you could let us know how you got interested in, in doing this sort of work, um, you know, how you fell into becoming an archaeologist in the first place. Well, my, my main interest was in, uh, in, in um, 
um, or stone artifact research, sort of indigenous heritage. And, but uh, I came up to Darwin and uh, managed to get some work at uh, the, the Maritime Museum in, in Darwin and, and uh, got hooked onto shipwreck sites. So, and then I was tasked uh, at, at, at the um, Museum and Archive of the Northern Territory uh, was to put together a, a, a gazetteer of sites in the proposed Beagle Gulf Marine Park. And, uh, and uh, we, had, uh, we had five Catalina flying boats in Darwin Harbour that no one knew anything about. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. There's, uh, there's, there's scope there for a master's thesis. So I, I, uh, I enrolled in a master's program to, uh, to study the Darwin Harbour. Catalina Rex, and uh, from there I, I've, 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 I sort of became the uh, the the uh, Catalina man. <laughs> I got that label somehow, and um, I then went on to to do the uh, broom research with uh, with the museum. Uh, there was, you know, fifteen sites there. I thought, gee, that's 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 enough material there to do a PhD. So uh, that's that's that, that's what's uh, led me into my flying boat research. But now I'm. You uh, know, um, I'm I'm looking at uh, any aviation sites now, not 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 just flying boats. I'm 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 intrigued by you know what's in the sea, you know, as well. Wonderful. Uh, we have another question from John. Uh, how deep are the deep water sites, and how deep is the water in general around Broome? Uh, deep water sites about twenty meters, eighteen to twenty meters. So uh, um, yeah, it's and it's it's really murky. It's really dark. Uh, there's Irukandji uh, jellyfish and box jellyfish, and there's tiger sharks and crocodiles, <laughs> and and um, sea snakes as well. <laughs> but they're they're all right. Um, the main issue is the uh, jellyfish, of course. But uh, um, the deepest water around Broome is in Roebuck Deep, about ninety meters deep. So that's uh, beyond um, uh, normal diving capability. You have to do um, um, technical diving to get to that, that sort of area. But that's where I suspect uh, the secondary deposition site is for a lot of the salvaged flying boats, possibly. So, yeah. Now, either that or they've just been dumped a bit further south of the main group of wrecks. So who knows? We, we might find a jumble of bits and pieces out there still, or actual intact wreck sites. Yeah. Um, Edward, do you want to ask the question that's popped up in the chat there from, uh, from Benjamin? Um, well, Benjamin asks, um, have any of the efforts been made to 3D scan the wreck for public viewing digitally via a museum website or a VR app, which is, is something that is very prevalent across a lot of museum sites these days. Um, so yeah, we're wondering that. Yeah, uh, well, that's... The that's something I I, 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 um, I forgot to mention was that while I'll, uh, while while in Broome in this September, I hope to uh, to go out to the the wrecks at uh, at low tide and to do uh, a, um, a a photogrammetry survey of the sites with with a drone. So that will that will give us a a a three D um, snapshots of uh, of the the, the, the sites. So that's that's going to be quite challenging, I think, but because uh, it's quite foggy in the mornings and when they're exposed, so, and there's only a, a very small window. But uh, I've got I've got three days to do the photogrammetry of six sites. So fingers crossed, I'll be able to get some uh, 3D imagery of them. Uh, in terms of the underwater wrecks, uh, um, I think uh, someone tried to do that in Darwin Harbour, but. It was, it was just too difficult because it's too murky. It didn't work out. And there was another question from Jeff about, um, is there much interest in tracking the location of the missing LB30, uh, B24, or the zero? Um, a few years ago, a um, Yarrawu elder, Jimmy Edwards, uh, took me out to a site that we suspected was the grave site of the Japanese pilot Kudo, but uh, I, we don't we don't think it is now, unfortunately. So if that was the case, if that was Kudo was there, his zero would be in, in Broome as well. But I don't know. I, I suspect he's uh, he, he tried to link back to Timor, 
and he, he's probably crashed in the Timor Sea somewhere. And as for the uh, Liberator, it's such a huge area to search for. So we're not sure. We're not sure. We haven't got any positive clues. We're hoping that uh, a fisherman might uh, report a wreck site one day, their, their favourite wreck site. And, you know, that's happened before in Darwin. Someone, someone thought they were fishing on a Catalina off Bathurst Island and it turned, it turned out to be the Florence D shipwreck, which was missing from the 19th of February air raid. So uh, you never know what, what can turn up. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really important that people report wreck sites when they find them. Um, we don't seem to have any other questions come in. I did. Yeah. Okay. So I think we might, when we're, we're nearly to time, so yes. we might we might wrap up. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been such an interesting discussion. Thanks, Georgia. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you, thank you again, and, able, and we yeah. we look forward to having you back perhaps next year as well. Hopefully, okay, yeah. Hopefully, with the with the results of this year's field survey. Yeah. Fantastic. Look forward to it. Yeah.